Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this panel uh, session on religious liberty and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I just want, my name's Bill Saunders. I'm the chairman of the Federalist Society's Religious Liberties Practice Group. And it's the practice groups that bring you these various uh, sessions, uh, the, they're co concurrent sessions right now in different rooms, et cetera. So if you're interested in religious liberty and want to be involved in that issue, we invite you to, to join the practice group. Um, we'd love to have you. And so now I'm just going to turn it over to our moderator this afternoon, Professor Michael Ullman. Thank you, Bill. Thank you all for coming. I have a public service announcement about buses. Uh, the buses to the Gaylord Center will be out on this street out here, right at the end of this panel, which wraps up around 5 o'clock. Uh, and buses will return at the end of the evening, beginning at 9.45 to 11 o'clock, and they'll drop you, drop you back here. Uh, there will, of course, be gun checks on this, cash only. Uh, slight discount for round trip. Uh, the money's to be contributed to a Swiss account uh, in my name. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll try to be brief. This is, uh, as you, those of you who are here know, this is uh, one of the least complicated subjects in modern law. Uh, those of us who, for our sins, are condemned to teach this from time to time, uh, uh, manage through the arts of barbers to retain our hair, but that's the only reason why we retain our hair. This is not, let us say, one of the more distinguished bodies of law that the Supreme Court has contrived, but there it is, uh, to be raveled and unraveled and re-raveled uh, again and again, which is why we earn the big bucks and uh, cause students to tear their hair out uh, and cause you to come to meetings like this where everyone has an opinion. Uh, which will likely be contradicted by someone else's opinion before the meeting is over. But to unravel all this, we have a very distinguished panel uh, who will do just that. If they don't, you can demand your money back. Uh, the, the nominal title of the panel is, is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the Future of Religious Liberty. This, of course, is a disguised topic. Uh, the real topic is, what the hell do we do about the First Amendment, and what is the relationship of reference to the First Amendment, and why are we all talking about a statute instead of the First Amendment? And in passing, why aren't we talking about how Scalia screwed everything up? But that's another subject for another day. <laughs> and here we all are, but these gentlemen really know what they're talking about. And in order of battle, uh, uh, we will lead off with uh, John Eastman, the Henry Salvatore Professor and former Dean at Chapman Law School. Uh, Rick Garnett, who is the uh, uh, Skirel, did I pronounce it right? And Fort Howard Professor of, of, of Law at Notre Dame Law School. He also has the virtue of teaching in the government department there. Uh, uh, William Marshall, who is the William Kennan Junior Professor at the University of North Carolina and the possessor of a wonderful set of government credentials in his prior incarnations, and last but not least, Phil Munoz, who is the, appropriately enough, the Tocqueville Associate Professor of the Government Department at Notre Dame, where he's occasionally allowed to teach a course in the law school. I would only add about Phil that he had the good judgment to take his doctoral degree at the Claremont Graduate University. So without more ado, let us turn it over to the Right Reverend Eastman, who will tell us all what to think for about eight minutes, and then it will all come unravel. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I also have a public service announcement. If you like Justice uh, Alito's talk this morning, uh, and you want to make a trip to the West Coast before California secedes, um, uh, Justice Alito is the recipient of our Churchill Statesmanship Award this year in February at the uh, annual Churchill Dinner of the Claremont Institute. So Lincoln's birthday weekend, it's a three-day weekend, you all can come to California and join us. Um, uh, this conference is uh, uh, honoring the legacy of Justice Scalia, and so it seems f fitting to begin my comments about religious liberty um, with one of his uh, more fun quips. 
Uh, this from his dissenting opinion in Lee versus Weissman. Church and state would not be such a difficult subject if religion were, as the court apparently thinks it to be, some purely personal avocation that can be indulged entirely like in secret, like pornography in the privacy of one's home. Not very often will you get pornography and religious liberty put into the same sentence, but he pulls it off. Look, one of the things that's happened uh, increasingly in uh, academic literature is the questioning of why religious liberty or religious exercise uh, ought even be entitled to some favored treatment. Um, uh, and there's really not much threat to religious liberty anyway. Those are kind of right-wing uh, accusations without any basis in substance. We can kind of gloss over, I suppose, the recent statement from the chairman of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. The phrases religious liberty and religious freedom will stand for nothing except hypocrisy so long as they remain code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, Christian supremacy, or any form of intolerance. I think we got all the deplorables in there all at once. <laughs> um, so liberal academics have been increasingly questioning why religious liberty claims get this favored treatment at all. There's a positivist answer, of course, because it's in the First Amendment. It's right there in the text. Um, but there's also a natural law or declaration of independence answer. We accommodate religious exercise claims because they reflect a duty owed to a higher authority. In fact, that's the same foundation on which our Declaration of Independence itself rests. Remember, the signers of that document were all committing treason. They appealed to a higher law, the laws of nature and nature's God, for the justness of their cause and the legitimacy of what they were undertaking. They said that legitimate government exists only by virtue of the consent of the governed. But that's a corollary that flows from the self-evident truth that all men, all human beings are created equal. And that the purpose of government to secure these unalienable rights with which we are endowed by our creator is a further corollary. That constrains the consent of the governed from being something that is raw majority democracy into a republican form which guarantees individual rights in the face of majority rule. And it's on that question that I want to take issue, I think, with Justice Scalia's opinion in Employment Division versus Smith. You will recall uh, that he adopts there uh, the, the rule that uh, religious claims uh, don't, aren't entitled to any special exemption from a generally applicable law. Um, the right to the free exercise of religion, he held, uh, does not requirement uh, does not require government to demonstrate a compelling interest before it could refuse to accommodate the religious conscience claim. That did not mean that um, protection for religious liberty was therefore banished from the political process, he noted. For a society that believes in the negative protection accorded to religious belief in the First Amendment can be expected to be solicitous of that value in its legislation as well. But then he acknowledged the, acknowledged the full import of his position. It may fairly be said that leaving an accommodation to the political process will place at a relative disadvantage those religious practices that are not widely engaged in. But that unavoidable consequence of democratic government must be preferred to a system in which each conscience is a law unto itself, or in which judges weigh the social importance of all laws against the centrality of all religious beliefs. In other words, the right to the freedom of conscience or the free exercise of religion exists not as an unalienable right judicially enforceable against the majoritarian political process, but rather only as the result of the political process, which is to say it's a benevolent gift of government, or more precisely, of the majority. It seems to me that turns the notion of self-evident truths in the Declaration of Independence upside down, the doctrine of unalienable rights that exist prior to government uh, into uh, a notion that we have these rights only by virtue uh, or the benefit of government. And, and so it's that point that I want to uh, uh, address to kind of set the, the terms of the discussion here about where we are on religious liberty exercise. Because all of the recent cases, of course, now no longer come up under the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. They come up under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Government has decided to let us have this heightened scrutiny uh, uh, to the extent it wishes. I remind people the day after the Hobby Lobby decision, there was a bill introduced in the Senate uh, 
that would repeal the protections of free exercise uh, for anybody that thought that their religious scruples prevented them from facilitating the provision of contraceptive and abortive patient care. Um, or, or, or financing that. So these are the questions I think we need to confront, uh, and, and I want to confront it uh, in ways that look back at the founding, not at the First Amendment's debates in Congress as the Bill of Rights was being proposed and debated, but oddly in the Second Amendment, uh, because there was a, a debate about religious exemption in that debate over the adoption of the Second Amendment. The first draft proposed it, but uh, an, a clause that didn't make its way into the final amendment. But no person religiously scrupulous shall be compelled to bear arms. And of course, this parallels uh, the idea that we have in the oath clause in the main text of the Constitution itself. Uh, every elected official is obligated to take an, by oath or affirmation to swear to defend the Constitution of the United States. The or affirmation clause was accommodation of those who were religiously scrupulous against taking oaths. It was not an atheist clause. It was a recognition of the importance of religious conscience. Uh, and the same thing exists in this debate in the Second Amendment. Um, uh, Representative Jackson proposed to add to that clause upon paying an equivalent to be established by law. Roger Sherman comes back, though. He says, it is well known that those who are religiously scrupulous of bearing arms, um, uh, for those from Ohio State, that means that they don't want to bear Ohio arms. I, I say that because I'm from Nebraska, and you guys just kicked us <laughs> really badly a couple weeks ago. Um, they're equally scrupulous of getting substitutes or paying an equivalent. Many of them would rather die than do either one or the other, Sherman says. Um, so he did not see an absolute necessity for this because we do not live, or live under an arbitrary government, he said. The implication is that we didn't need that specific textual protection because it would be the definition of arbitrary government not to give an accommodation uh, that, uh, to, to recognize people's religious accommodations. Now, um, the, the, the other great founder that talks about this in very terms, this notion that the, the accommodation, the exemption from even generally applicable laws that the First Amendment used to provide, um, Madison's Memorial and Remonstrance, I think, lays the foundation for this idea. The duty we owe to the Creator, he said, is precedent, both in order of time and in degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. Um, that seems to be a, exactly right. It's precedent. It exists. This is the whole notion of inalienable rights that he talks about, that Jefferson talked about in the Declaration. This right, Madison continues, is in its nature an inalienable right. It is inalienable because the opinions of men, depending only on the evidence contemplated in their, by their own minds, cannot follow the dictates of other men. It is inalienable also, he says, because what is here a right towards men is a duty towards the Creator. It is the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. This duty is precedent, as I said a moment ago, both in order of time and degree to the, any claims of civil society. All right? And then he goes on. True it is that no other rule exists by which any question which may divide a society can be ultimately determined but the will of the majority. There's Justice Scalia's opinion in Employment Division versus Smith. But it's also true that the majority may trespass on the rights of the minority. Now, he's not saying the majority has this power to do it. He's saying it would be illegitimate were the majority to do that. That recognizes this, this right, the freedom of conscience, the free exercise of religion, the duty, the higher duty one owes to the creator that precedes any notion of civil society, at least legitimate civil society, um, requires that these claims be accommodated. We used to have a test that we've now codified in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that put it on such footing that it was hard to, for government not to accommodate such requests. The claim of government had to be truly compelling, not watered down compelling and certainly not just legitimate or rational basis, truly compelling because the stakes for the person that you were compelling to take such actions in violation of their conscience, of the duty they owe to their creator, the precedent and paramount duty, the inalienable right to exercise which that they have and is recognized in the declaration. This is the stuff 
that the original understanding of the free exercise of religion uh, provided to us. Uh, and it's that kind of stuff that we have lost as we broadly confronted questions, various questions of what c constitutes compelling interest of the government, uh, is anti-discrimination in every constance, uh, a baker or whatever, the baker, uh, the, the candlestick makers or whoever want to do these things. Um, you know, all of those things that run, foul, run afoul of the freedom of conscience uh, also run afoul of this original understanding of this precedent obligation one owes to the creator, the very stuff on which the foundation of our republic rests, at least to borrow the language of the Declaration of Independence. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to all of you for being here. Uh, thanks, Bill Saunders, for putting this together and um, for including me. So the title of this session invites us to make a prediction about, quote, the future of religious liberty. And I, like many of you, I suspect, I'm feeling more than a little bit sheepish about making predictions. Uh, it turns out Yogi Berra was right. It is tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Now, when I first put together my remarks a few weeks ago, I was, like everybody in my academic bubble, quite confident in the outcome of the recent election. And I was confident, I was gloomy, but I was confident about the implications of that outcome for religious freedom in America. Now, I had to scrap that talk, but just suffice it to say that it was accurate and sound and correct in every way, except in being totally wrong about the prediction. So what about now? I tend to be, I confess, uh, a conservative of a kind of gloomy, doer, resigned nature, kind of a puddle glum. But I feel like that's not appropriate uh, for this setting because after all, we're celebrating 25 years of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. We're celebrating 25 years with Leonard Leo at the helm of the Federal Society. And of course, we're celebrating the legacy of Justice Scalia. So I'm gonna step out of character, put on a sunny face, and uh, try to suggest that we have uh, some reasons to be hopeful with respect to our subject. Uh, but not to be complacent. So in the time I have, I'm going to set out one big picture claim, two reasons for guarded optimism, we can't go crazy here, and then three causes for cautious concern. Here's the first big picture claim. As I see it, the project of religious freedom under law is easy when everyone agrees or governments don't do much. Pluralism plus the modern active regulatory welfare state necessarily means that there will be conflict, tension, and dissent. So how do you manage that? Well, one answer would be to ignore or to squash or suppress the dissent. But as Robert Jackson once reminded us, that can lead to the uniformity of the graveyard. So the other strategy is to tolerate and manage the inevitable conflicts that result when you add pluralism to government work. That's the strategy we've chosen, right? We've chosen that strategy because of our commitment to fundamental human rights and religious freedom is such a right. The second path, this toleration and accommodation path, and RIFRA is an example of such an effort, right? It's an effort to manage the inevitable conflict by generously accommodating sincere believers. And I think this strategy works, generally speaking. So I think since the conflicts are inevitable going forward, I think this RIFRA type strategy should be and will be part of the future of religious liberty. That's the big picture claim. Now, two reasons for optimism. Besides the obvious fact that I suspect the relevant personnel are going to be more favorable to religious freedom, at least for the next few years. As I see it, first, the most important church state case of the last 25 years was Hosanna Tabor. And that case was unanimous, and I think its reasoning was powerful. And it's important to remember that in that case, the entire court affirmed the importance of religious institutions, their autonomy, their ability to decide for themselves who will be their teachers and ministers and leaders and what will be their, teach their teachings. And most importantly, the Hosanna Tabor Court didn't proceed by balancing off religious freedom as merely an interest to be weighed against the government's interest. Instead, the way the court framed the issue was to say, given our commitments to religious freedom, both the free exercise and the no establishment norm, the government lacks the power to interfere. Even when the government's pursuing an important end like anti-discrimination, the government lacks the power to interfere in this core area of religious freedom. That's hopeful. 
A second related reason for cautious optimism is that religious freedom claimants are, despite what we might, we might sometimes think from our Facebook feeds, are winning. In many of the RIFRA type cases that actually come to decision, the religious freedom claimants are winning. Our lawyers are doing a good job. The Holt v. Hobbs case, which is a RIFRA type case, it involved the, the Prison Act, of course, but that was 9-0 also. Right? Now, there are some doctrinal issues being worked out. Uh, we saw in the Hobby Lobby and then afterwards the uh, Little Sisters of the Poor case, that there certainly is some division on some matters. But if we step back, and you know, acknowledging that there are some cases where we, where we lose, as in the Stormans case, which Justice Alito talked about this morning, I think it's fair to say that courts are, when asked to do so, taking RIFRA-type arguments seriously. That's another cause, I think, for hope going forward. All right, so three causes for watchful concern. Again, in my original remarks, this section was titled Three Reasons We Are Doomed, but I, I've, <laughs> I'm revising that. This, this is the new sunny me. Um, so uh, first, in many contexts and with many people, religious freedom has a branding problem. So 25 years ago, President Clinton signs the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. He calls it our first freedom. It was enacted in an orgy of bipartisanship, you know, with uh, Senators Kennedy and Hatch uh, uh, working together. Now, newspapers, when they report on religious freedom issues, feel the need to put the term in scare quotes. Uh, you already heard the quote from the commissioner on the U.S. Uh, Commission on Civil Rights, who referred to religious freedom as simply a code word for discrimination. We see celebrities and CEOs who have no problem doing business in China, Venezuela, or Saudi Arabia calling for boycotts of states like Indiana, Arizona, or North Carolina. So what can be done about this branding problem? Uh, I'm not sure, but I do have a thought. And one is that we have to make sure, those of us who are committed to religious freedom, that our arguments for religious freedom are always in terms of religious freedom for all. Religious freedom as a fundamental human right, not a right that belongs to those of us who share our religious beliefs. This, I think, I hope, could help with some of the, uh, some of the mis misbranding. The second cause for concern, I think, is related to the first. And that's the problem that law is, as I see it, downstream from culture. And I think there are certain cultural and sociological and demographic facts and trends that I think make religious freedom vulnerable. Now, in saying that, I'm very aware, and again, I'm chastened by the recent uh, election results about which I was so wrong, that history does not have a side or a clear direction, at least not this side of heaven. But still, I don't think these trends and, uh, uh, and facts have changed in light of the election. So the first is the so-called rise of the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, that is people who report no religious affiliation. The second trend is the weakening of religious institutions and communities, and this could be, you know, in some cases because of scandals and so on, but in other cases just because of the effects of a kind of atomizing individualism. And then another trend is the increasing tensions and conflicts between traditional religion on the one hand and the sexual revolution and its working out on the other. The reason why I highlight that is because that's an area where it seems like, unlike perhaps peyote laws, compromise is very difficult for some uh, to agree to. Right? The danger of these, the danger that these trends pose, it seems to me, is that religious freedom can start to be seen as kind of a luxury good, as something that a few people have a stake in, but that many don't. And I think it's important that the sort of religious freedom message always be that religious freedom is something like clean air in which we all have a stake, right? All of us benefit, whether we're believers or not, if we have a government that's committed to the idea that there's something above that government. And then finally, the third cause for concern, and this is actually, for me, the most important thing I'd like to leave you with um, and, and to, to think about. So we tend to think about religious freedom cases and problems in terms of the regulatory sphere. Right? So the, the paradigm case is the government enacts and applies an otherwise lawful rule, but it burdens somebody's sincerely held religious beliefs, so what do we do? Do we accommodate, do we not accommodate, and so on. And as I said earlier, this accommodation strategy in the regulatory arena works well. Again, RIFRA-type statutes work well, I think, for dealing with this kind of religious freedom burden. But I think, looking forward, footnote, my predictions are useless, but I think, looking forward, that the burdens that we're going to see most often are not going to be imposed by regulations so much as by conditions. 
conditions on employment, conditions on accreditation, conditions on professional degrees, conditions on the ability to practice law or medicine or pharmacy, conditions on tax exemptions, conditions on uh, benefits like school vouchers, conditions on student loans, conditions on licenses, say for an adoption agency, conditions attached to, title, uh, attached to education funding, think of Title IX, for example, and conditions on government grants and contracts. In all of these kinds of instances, the government is seeking to leverage its power, its power to spend, into a kind of regulatory effect but a RIFRA type strategy isn't very well suited for dealing with those kinds of conditions, which can burden religious freedom. So what I think is needed is something like the First Amendment Defense Act, which some of you might have, been, uh, might have read about and that's been uh, proposed. But more generally, as we work through these conditions cases, I think we all need to go to the bookstore and buy my colleague John Anazu's book called Confident Pluralism, which lays out a really helpful way of thinking through these conditional spending type problems. So let me end on a happy note. This morning, uh, Justice Alito painted for us a wonderful picture of uh, the angelic doctor Thomas Aquinas and Justice Scalia hashing out their differences over a, a good bottle of red wine. Here's another, uh, as, as one of the few sort of defenders in the academy of Justice Scalia's uh, Smith opinion, let me suggest another picture. And that's Justice Scalia at a big table full of AV's anchovy pizza surrounded by all of his academic critics, finally setting them straight on the original meaning of the free exercise clause. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks to Bill Saunders, and thank you all for uh, having me here today, and uh, thanks to the rest of this panel. Um, I really enjoy being invited to the Federal Society, speak to the Federal Society. I'm on the board of the American Constitution Society, and I think it's a great tribute to this organization that it's interested in talking across ideological lines. And if we ever needed a time that we have to be able to talk to each other, this is the time that, uh, that we need going forward. And I, I also explained to folks, I've said this before here, so pardon me if you've heard it before, but my dad was a conservative Republican and my mom was a liberal Democrat. And I could say whatever I wanted as long as I could defend it. And so I'm used to actually talking across ideological lines. And, you know, much later I realized how much, mo you know, how much smarter my mother was, but still. Um, <clears throat> uh, so thank you very much for having me here today. The other irony of having me here today is, uh, uh, as Rick said, he's a defender of Smith. I, I was a defender of Smith. I got tenure because of Smith, probably, in defending free exercise. But for me to come here as a... As a, as a veteran of the Clinton administration, uh, the, the first Clinton administration, the second one, we'll see what happens with the Electoral College. But, uh, 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 but to come here, and I'm the one who's defending Smith against the attacks of the Federalist Society, I think is really a delicious irony. So, uh, so thank you for having me, uh, having me here today. Uh, I want to make four essential points. The first is that this, despite the claims of some, the constitutional protection for religious liberty is very vibrant under existing doctrine and is likely to remain so. As Rick pointed out, Hosanna Tabor, a tremendous defense of, of a religious freedom and tremendous defense of the institutional rights of religious organizations. The speech clause has provided tremendous protection for proselytization, prayer, and other kinds of essential liberty. In fact, if you take a look at our constitutional history, it was the speech clause that defended religion all the way up to the Sherbert case, not the religion case. And when the Sherbert uh, case gave us, under Justice, under Justice Brennan, by the way, uh, a, free, a, a compelling interest test, uh, that was the first time that religion had been singled out. Prior to that, prior to that the cases that indicated that religion was not going to get any more protection than speech but it would get the same amount of speech. And Smith itself, we forget, I mean, I mean the, the compelling interest test that, uh, that was abandoned in Smith was only 17 years. We have lived without constitutionally based religious exemptions for the vast majority of our constitutional history, and yet the constitutional protection for religion is very vibrant. I think one of the reasons, I, I can defend Smith specifically, but I think the major reason why uh, 
it became increasingly difficult to uphold a free exercise regime. And as everybody who studied the cases after Sherbert know, it wasn't a particularly powerful free exercise regime. It was very lukewarm. It was very watered down. And I think part of the problem was that it was very difficult to distinguish or to argue why religious kinds of beliefs were entitled to greater kinds of constitutional protection than non-religious beliefs. That was one of the things that was that was motivating Justice Scalia in Smith, as well as the concern that you can have a religious objection against anything. So virtually, you make every law presumptively unconstitutional, but you do so only with a limited group. And does it really make sense to distinguish certain kinds of believers from other kinds of believers? And I, I think the case that really put the nail in the free exercise clause was a case in which the free exercise claimant won. That was a case called Thomas versus Review Board in which a Jehovah's Witness said he didn't want to have to work on a, an assembly line that made turrets, gun turrets. There was no indication that Jehovah's Witness doctrine demanded that particular result. The claimant himself didn't have any objection to working on another assembly line in the plant which would feed the gun turret line. But if you read the record pretty carefully, it's unclear whether the basis of the claimant's belief was. Was it philosophical? or was it moral? And I dare say if we ask ourselves the question, I'm sure most of the folks here, uh, I'm sure everybody in this room thinks that stealing is wrong, okay? If you believe that, what's that based on? Is that based on religious beliefs? Or is it based on moral belief? It's very hard for us to even distinguish in our own minds what the nature of our beliefs were, but to say that if you characterize something as one way, you're gonna get an exemption, but if you characterize it another way, you won't, uh, it creates a strange kind of ideological balance. Also invites strategic behavior, which I think Justice Scalia was also concerned about. Claims against people who don't want to pay minimum wage or people who want to be exempted from certain taxes. So that's my second point. Part of the, pro the reason why we had a decline in free exercise was because it's difficult to distinguish religious ideology from non-religious ideology. A third point that I want to make is, is precisely for that reason, the weakening of the free exercise clause protections has been accompanied by a weakening of the anti-establishment provisions. So you now have a situation that if you are funding secular groups, it's okay to fund religious groups on the same terms you're funding the secular groups. That's a weakening of where establishment was in a very separationist concern that dominated establishment clause jurisprudence for some times, and I think that's the flip side of the weakening of the free exercise clause. And finally, the fourth point I want to make as to why I think, and, and this might come out in, in, in RIFRA cases and later on, is that, it, is that as, uh, as Rick pointed out, after, after Smith was decided, an unusual thing happened in this city. People from the very left and the very right came together to pass the Religious Freedom Restoration Act signed by Bill Clinton. But I think there were overlapping concerns, but I think the concern from one side of the equation was slightly different than the other. For Justice Brennan, the reason why he was very interested in protecting free exercise of religion so strongly is he was, he was interested in protecting minority groups and minority religions, which was consistent with his over, overall view of the Constitution generally. The interest of some other, of other folks as to why they want to refer overturned sort of echoed, I think, what John Eastman was talking about, which was an interest in protecting religion for the, for the, for the, uh, for the sanctity of religion and for, and for the, the idea that it is a primary freedom. In most cases, these rationales overlap. They overlap in a case like Holt versus Hobbes. They overlap when we're dealing with, with minority religion seeking exemption, except in a certain kind of case in which what you're seeking exemption from is a law that is designed to protect other groups, which is why the discrimination laws raise these questions, because one side sees the vindication of religious exercise as interfering with an equal protection concern where the other side sees the vindicating of the religious interest as promoting the value of religious liberty. So that comes up 
in a series of cases that, that, happen, that, that raise this particular problem, which of course are the center of the culture wars. So it's interesting to think about, for me anyway, is what is this battle going to look like when the strength of the culture wars have subsided and we see religion not so much as, as antithetical to protecting the rights of minority groups in certain kinds of cases, limited kinds of cases. And I have to agree that I think it's been overstated how much that actually happens. But it'll be interesting to see how we view religion when some of these culture wars are over and we're really dealing with accommodating particular kinds of minority beliefs that don't have much salience in the political process. So I'm looking forward to seeing how those kinds of cases are going to be resolved. We have a pretty good instance so far, which is Holt versus Hobbes, and, and a case before that dealing with the protection of, of a minority religious groups to use certain kinds of otherwise prohibited drugs. But those kinds of cases are going to test where we are uh, with respect to protecting a freedom of religion, and they're going to bring both of these kinds of themes the protection of religious minorities, along with the protection of the intrinsic value of religion itself, together in, 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 in one kind of case. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much for attending the panel. Uh, I want to thank especially uh, the Religious Liberties uh, Practice Group and Bill Saunders and Dean Ruder for the kind invitation to speak uh, speak with you. Uh, I, uh, John Eastman and Rick Garnett are good friends. Uh, professor Yolman is my, o my old professor from uh, when I was a student. Uh, I've only met uh, William Marshall today, but uh, I have great respect for your work, and uh, so it's really an honor for me to, uh, to be here with this group. Uh, I'm a political theorist by training, uh, not a lawyer. And uh, that leads me to uh, take a view of things from a, a, a bigger picture, um, maybe less accurate, uh, uh, maybe less realistic. Uh, but anyways, that's uh, the perspective I'm, I'm coming from, and that's how I'm going to try to answer the question uh, posed. Is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act the future of religious liberty? Uh, I thought it was a yes or no question. Uh, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, and yes, for obvious reasons that no one has stated yet. Uh, the Republicans hold Congress, and that means there's probably going to be no legislative movement to try to repeal and replace RIFRA, which I think uh, would, uh, would, would happen if the Democrats uh, had the presidency in Congress. And it's certainly uh, likely, though no means uh, certain, that the judges uh, President Trump, will, the Trump administration will appoint, and that the Republican-controlled Senate uh, will confirm, will be more friendly towards religious liberty and RIFRA claims. Uh, but if you ask me, uh, is this a good thing that RIFRA uh, is the future of religious liberty, whether we should be pleased that RIFRA is likely to be the primary way we attempt to protect religious liberty, uh, my answer uh, is actually probably, probably not, that we shouldn't be pleased. Uh, at least not if one is primarily concerned about, re concerned about the religious freedom of believers who fa whose face are opposed to the tenets of the sexual revolution. I say this because I do not believe that uh, RIFRA or any other scheme of exemptions in the long run can adequately safeguard religious liberty against the political imposition of the sexual revolution. I also fear that <clears throat> our emphasis on securing exemptions preempts advocates of religious liberty from making the types of arguments and building the sort of political coalition that might, and I want to emphasize might, have a chance of actually securing religious freedom in the long run. Uh, those are pretty uh, sort of bold claims. Um, so let me just put the proposition, I'm gonna put three propositions on the table and you know, we can talk about them as much as you want. Uh, the first proposition, uh, RIFRA is sufficiently porous that it will not stop the political imposition of the sexual re uh, revolution on traditional religious believers. Uh, when we talk about RIFRA, we often speak about uh, a right of exemptions from burdensome laws, but we actually speak to imprecisely. The civil right offered by exemption legislation is a right to a judicial process by which a religious litigant asks for a law not to be applied against them. That means the civil right is a right to plead for toleration. The judicial process that grants, as everyone in this room knows, that grants or denies toleration to the religious individual 
turns upon questions about whether those individuals are actually burdened and substantially if they are, and whether the state pursues a compelling interest or, uh, and if they do, if that interest is sufficiently tailored. In a post-Obergefell Obergefell world, where opposition to sexual autonomy is thought akin to racism, traditional religious believers, I think, are more likely to lose such cases in the future. At least when they, and especially when they are seeking exemptions from non-discrimination laws or regulations related to sexual autonomy. Because advocates of such laws, which undoubtedly will include a large portion of the federal judiciary, will, will see those laws as compelling and will see their universal application as uh, certainly necessary. Trump's election might delay this. Uh, as I said, a Trump, uh, the Trump judiciary might be more friendly to traditional religious believers. But the underlying facts that America, has, uh, America and Americans have accepted the sexual revolution and that we now live in a post-Christian society, those facts are here to stay. Once the moral norm of sexual autonomy is established in our culture, and it probably already has been established, discretionary exemptions uh, are not going to be granted. Okay, my second proposition is that uh, while the sexual revolution is here, to say, he is here to stay, it may or may not be imposed through the course of for force of law. Um, this is sort of an empirical claim, I suppose. Um, I, it's hard to measure this. What, what do I use for a proxy? Let me use the issue of taxpayer funded, a uh, taxpayer funding of abortions. Recent polls show that a slight majority of Americans identify themselves as pro-choice, but a 60, about 60 percent of Americans say they are opposed to taxpayer funded abortions. Uh, in one recent poll, 45 percent of those who identified themselves as pro-choice. So, uh, of the pro-choice identifiers, 45% said they also oppose taxpayer-funded of abortions. What do those figures reflect? Uh, I think, or at least I hope, they reflect a deep-seated, pragmatic uh, American approach of live and let live. Uh, this sort of feeling that we shouldn't impose our views on other Americans is uh, intuitive uh, to most Americans. What that means is, while the sexual revolution might be here to, say, here to stay, uh, many Americans, or maybe even most Americans, uh, I hope, will be hesitant to impose it through the force of law, impose participation in it. This concern for freedom that animates both the sexual revolution and American pragmatism, I think, uh, can lead us down one of two paths. Option A, path, path one, would be to take a libertarian approach, which is in truth really a classical liberal approach to law, and emphasize that the law ought to favor individual freedom by leaving people alone. So abortion, we may say, is legal, but it's not publicly funded. Abortifacients are readily, readily available, but we don't make anyone prescribe them or buy them for anyone else. Private discrimination on the basis of religion, or political views, of sexual orientation may be unfortunate, we may be against it, but because we cherish freedom generally, and freedom of association in particular, we let people live their own lives and run their own businesses as they see fit. This is one option. Admittedly, not likely, but still an option. The other option, option B, is that we actually establish the sexual revolution. And I use establish intentionally. We treat matters of sexual autonomy like we have treated race, and we use the law to a, a, attempt to usher in a deep and thorough moral reformation of civil society. I mean, this is, I think, what candidate Clinton was talking about when she said religion has to change. But because there'll still be some religious opposition to the sexual revolution, to, that is to legislate the sexual revolution in option B, uh, option B will come with the promise of exemptions for religious believers. RIFRA and state RIFRAs or other exemptions will, presented, will be presented by the proponents of sexual autonomy uh, and proponents of the civil rights leg legislation as reasons why religious believers should not stand opposed to such legislation. Uh, let us have gay marriage, it won't affect you in any way. We'll give you an exemption. And herein lies the danger. Because proponents of religious liberty have become accustomed to understanding religious liberty as exemptions, uh, they'll be tempted to take this bargain as the best thing they can get. <laughs> 
that's understandable. But if they do, as I stated at the beginning of my comments, I believe that eventually uh, they'll lose their religious liberty. It will take some time, but eventually courts will find that there are compelling reasons to apply non-discrimination norms equally on all of us. Uh, in a contemporary America, you don't want to be on the wrong side of equality, and you don't want to be on the wrong side of laws that impose equality. And that's exactly where exemptions will place traditional religious believers. My third proposition uh, uh, follows, and I'll conclude with this. Uh, if traditional religious believers want to preserve their re religious liberty, they actually ought to talk less about the specialness of religion. They should talk less about the importance of their own particular commitments, and instead talk more about the common good of limited government and emphasize our shared principles of individual liberty. Adopting identity politics, where traditional religious believers become, like every other liberal interest group, an interest group that claims special treatment, might look appealing. We might be able to win some victories. But we need to remember that traditional religion, especially traditional religious believers, um, have not been historically oppressed in America. And therefore, they, don't, they won't have and they won't receive the, tradition, the liberal guilt that follows from historical oppression. And that won't make traditional religious believers sympathetic. Without this sympathy, the type of interest group thinking that RIFRA encourages and actually depends on to win will not end up protecting religious freedom in the long run. Thank you very much. this elaborate, can you hear me all right? Yep. Uh, this elaborate First Amendment consensus. Either there is or isn't a natural right to religion. Uh, either there is or isn't uh, a, 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 a statutory supplement to the First Amendment that's necessary. Uh, RIFRA, that statutory supplement, either is or isn't a good and, and, and managed, uh, a well-managed tool uh, and finally, American opinion either is or isn't in favor of further religious exemptions, which either should or shouldn't be talked about as exemptions as such. So with that consensus, I think we can all leave and thank our panelists, right? <laughs> but I, 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 will, uh, I think we should start by allowing the panelists to have at one another and to see if we can't shatter this consensus a little bit. Uh, gentlemen, anybody wish to comment? Yeah, so I, I want to push back a little bit um, uh, with two questions. One for Professor Marshall. Um, uh, you know, I laid out the founder's uh, understanding that why we have the preferred place for religious exercise, this freedom of conscience, is because it is derived from a duty one owes to a higher authority and that it pre-exists government. And, and like other inalienable rights, it's the purpose of government to secure that right. Uh, we don't get the same kind of claim from, I have a moral objection to that, or, or whatever, because the, the, there's no higher duty uh, to a creator and certainly no higher consequence for ignoring that duty uh, that exists in those other things. So I, I, I pose that to you just w w with the question, does that uh, provide some rationale uh, for this heightened scrutiny we get? But the second, the second question I want to pose uh, for all of us to think about is this notion of our public accommodation laws. And, and I think uh, Philip is right that um, RIFRA or a reconstituted heightened scrutiny under the First Amendment directly, as I proposed, are not going to solve the problem of the modern conflict with the sexual revolution and religious exercise if we don't confront what it is about those generally applicable public, public accommodation laws that is theoretically unsound. Uh, because the way we're treating those laws now uh, requires government to commit first order discrimination against religious believers in order to prevent third order discrimination by private entities against others. And that seems something's fundamentally wrong about that. The original idea of anti-discrimination laws what is, it was, you know, it applied to the states. The states, the government cannot discriminate amongst its citizens. And we extended it ever so briefly, you know, I'm going to be a little anachronistic here. The English did this, you know, half a millennium earlier, uh, to true public accommodations. Uh, 
uh, the theater, the inn out in the middle of nowhere, those that had a monopoly license from the king. We extended it further, and now we've extended it so that it has completely obliterated uh, any distinction between public and private. That if you engage in uh, earning a living, you walk out your front door of your church or your home or your synagogue, you are now subject to public accommodation. And that's, this, I think, makes very salient Justice Scalia's recognition that these conflicts arise because religion isn't something one keeps in the privacy of one's home. And so it's this expansion of public accommodation law and the equating of choosing to further religious belief with invidious discrimination that used to be conducted by the state that has to be confronted, I think, if the religious liberty claims are ever going to get some traction and start winning these cases ultimately. And that's a much more difficult problem because we crazy. What, what compelling interest is there in the government forcing a baker or forcing a, a druggist to provide an abortifacient drug What's, when, when they can be easily available elsewhere, right? Phrase in those terms rather than the other way, the government has a compelling interest in, er in eradicating all discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity or whatever the cause celeb for the day is, right? We've never really drilled down and asked why is that presumption of these broadening of public accommodation laws even legitimate, much less dispositive? Well, a couple of things there. One is, in, in terms of the question of in not all religion thinks itself subject to higher powers with the idea of eternal consequence. And the more the idea of religion is broadened to include those religions that don't have that consequence, the distinction that I think you are making between religious conscience and other kinds of conscience begins to fade a little bit. And when we also take a look at just the nature of belief in our modern society, I, we have a different, th th there's, there's so many different ways that people express the Tillichian notion of what, what is a central concern that it becomes harder and harder to distinguish one kind of belief system from another kind of belief system. And I think the Thomas case was an example was an example of that as to why it's harder. And I think that's why it's harder in the establishment area to say we're going to let a secular organization provide drug treatment, but we're not going to let Lutheran charities provide it or Catholic charities. I think that's what's caused the fading on that as well. With respect to the public accommodation laws and the question of whether they're good or not, I mean, I, I think one of the points I was trying to make was you know, that's where the culture wars come in. But a lot of religious issues, when you're seeking accommodation, don't deal with that. I mean, there wasn't, the interesting thing about the Smith case is it dealt with denying uh, Native Americans access to peyote, although there had been a couple hundred years of showing that that was a deep ritual. Not that many people, and people were interested in overturning the decision, not that many people were that concerned about protecting the rights of Native Americans on that issue because it didn't cut to the heart of the majoritarian or at least a sizable element of the culture that believed in that. But think about some other cases going forward that might come up. What about a religious organization that wants to defy immigration laws by having sanctuary? How are we gonna deal with those kinds of cases? Um, let's try to think about other cases outside the box that just don't implicate the, uh, the culture war issues that we're talking about, and I think on that, on that sense, Rick, Rick and I made a, have made careers about disagreeing with each other, but I have to uh, agree with his final conclusion, which is that if we're gonna talk about this, we really have to talk about this in terms of all religion, and not just particularly religions that have particular problems with, <laughs> with uh, the kinds of laws that have come out of, uh, of the sexual revolution, because this is an across the board issue, not just that kind of issue. I just want to really briefly uh, underscore something that John said that had the real virtue of cohering well with what I said. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, his point about how the religious freedom challenge uh, is exacerbated by the um, uh, amplification of public accommodations laws I think is right. And I think my point about funding and conditions and licensing is a similar point. That is. What's happening when the government increasingly tries to attach conditions to things like licenses or the ability to practice law or the ability to open an adoption agency or the ability to receive funds for student loans is a, um, a kind of takeover of civil society, a kind of expansion of the sphere in which 
uh, the government's understanding of non-discrimination norms control. And one of the points uh, I was trying to make the, uh, is that we ought to be cautious about and indeed resist, not, not resisting the funding programs, but resisting the uh, ability of the state to use that as leverage for constricting the civil society sphere and indeed the private sphere as well. So, so thanks for that, John. Uh, Phil, you want to add anything? Yes. Well, let's open it up to uh, the audience, shall we? Uh, yes, are there mics I, out there? I yeah. can't see with the mic. Uh, uh, great panel, really enjoyed it. Um, the question that I think was uh, touched on by Dr. Eastman, but Smith is this very harsh Hobbesian positive law idea. Um, and Justice Kennedy, in kind of his series of uh, poetic opinions, kind of like going through Casey, Lawrence, Obergefell, has brought this kind of bizarre uh, dignity, very natural law jurisprudence into an area with moral questions. So I'm wondering, going forward, what you all think is the better language to make these arguments or the doctrine from the judicial side, whether it's from the positive law angle or the natural law angle. Thank you. Well, you, you've kind of stacked the question there by defining the natural law angle as Justice Kennedy opinions. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me put it this way. Um, the natural law properly understood <laughs> is the right way to go. And that's the way Jefferson does it in the Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, I don't think Kennedy gets that right or even close to right in his trilogy. Romer and Lawrence and uh, Obergefell, uh, nor do I think uh, uh, did Justice Blackman get it right in Roe or um, the Trioka of the, the per curiam opinion, Troika in, uh, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. You see these, the, the, these notions of natural rights are tied to um, nature and nature's God, both reason and revelation, and they both point in the same direction on both all of those questions. But let me take up the role question. I mean, the notion that one has a natural, or no, let me take, avoid the controversy. Um, let me take up one of the new claims. I have a right to free college education that taxpayers will pay for, or I have a right to free public housing that taxpayers will pay for. In fact, these things are now being pushed so strenuously on the international front that folks are trying to get them added to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that this is a fundamental inalienable right uh, think about that just on the law of contradiction. I have a fundamental inalienable right to have you pay for my housing, is what those claims mean, or you pay for my contraceptives. Um, and that deprives somebody else of their fundamental human right, which was the basis of these rights, to keep the proceeds of your own labor. Right? So, so the way you push back on these things, to, from positive law to the natural law rightly understood, is to challenge the premises of the spurious claims of natural law or natural right that have led to these errors. There's no natural right to kill the unborn child in your, in your womb. There's simply not, or any more than there's a natural right to demand that somebody else pay for your housing. We used to have a rule for that before the, the Civil War, we, a word for that. Right? And so I think, I think confronting it in those terms to really understand what the natural law claim is um, needs to be done if we're going to try and reconcile these what otherwise appear to be competing claims with, that are irreconcilable and therefore subject just to majority rule. Uh, oh, sorry, awkward here. Um, uh, my name is Jared Mayer. I'm a student at Johns Hopkins University. Um, my question is for Professor Eastman, although I welcome the entire panel to respond as well. Um, if I understood your position correctly, it's that the natural law tradition of religious liberty in America has uh, <laughs> deeply Lockean premises. And if that is correct, I'm wondering whether Justice Scalia's Smith opinion uh, actually violates these Lockean premises. Um, uh, considering that Locke argues that religious liberty can exist uh, so long as religious law does not conflict with uh, well-established civil law. So I just wanted to hear your uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, so, you know, that's a good point. And we tried, we tried to get at it by the compelling interest test um, uh, that, that Scalia is right to some extent. Every, every minor claim of religious exercise um, uh, can't prevail without so disrupting civil society that you couldn't have civil society. So, so we try and get at that uh, 
both is it sincerely held and a substantial burden on your religion. We try and get it on the front end. Uh, and we try and then um, get on the back end on the government side of the equation with is there really a compelling interest. All right? And that test seemed to tr take account of that lock-in idea. All right? But Locke also recognizes that there are r religious duties that one owes um, uh, because, precisely because they're owed to a higher authority. And it's the same claim that gives us the ground to challenge the legitimacy of a, the divine right of king monarch because it was violating some basic uh, precepts. So, so the, the Lockean rule builds in to the stuff this idea of the higher duty. And then where, where you can allow that to be tolerated. Look, if the, uh, e, e, the founders would not have given an exemption to the Quakers who were scrupulous of bearing arms if by doing so uh, uh, the country is overrun and enslaved, right? So there were limits on that. But shy of that, we're going to accommodate that religious claim because, you know, that's where they recognized the higher duty was. I mean, I, I think, and, and, that, and that compelling interest test got us pretty close to the right balance on that, it seems to me. So what's, what's going to happen when, when John's at this big AV's pizza table in, in heaven with Justice Scalia? is Justice Scalia is going to say, no, here's what I meant uh, in Smith, and here's what I was trying to get at. I don't take Justice Scalia and Smith to be denying at all the non-positivistic foundations of religious freedom. Obviously, the reason why religious freedom is a good, the reason why it exists, the reason why we have it, is not because of a concession from government. It's because it's hardwired into our nature, at least so I believe. I take Justice Scalia's opinion in Smith to be making a much more modest claim, which is about the institutional competence, the comparative institutional competence of institutions to strike the balance that's required in any accommodation. So the Quaker example we've heard about, that was an accommodation. It wasn't imposed by a court. It's perfectly appropriate for a particular actor. In that case, it was Congress, and now under RIFRA, it's going to be Congress as well, um, to take account of, again, the, the, the deep fundamental perhaps theological, perhaps Lockean foundations of religious freedom, but there's still the hard task in the particular case of balancing out when you can give an accommodation and when you can't. And I think Justice Scalia and Smith, again, was simply saying, we as an unelected judiciary are not institutionally well suited to second guess the often really uh, delicate, tricky, fact-specific con uh, context-sensitive decisions that go into religious accommodation. Can I add a little bit to that? Because, because part of the problem that he was concerned about is what John called the threshold questions of burden and sincerity. But the problems of, of, of even looking into burden and sincerity raise their own religion clause issues. How do you determine if a religious belief is sincere? How do you determine what a burden is? Uh, in Hobby Lobby, what Justice Alito said is, look, if they're going to describe it as a burden, I'm not going to second guess whether it's a burden. But if, if, if you defer in that way, and the sincerity issue has its own problems, how do you determine what's sincere without judging the validity of what is being, being uh, claimed to be a religion? If you get over those, you automatically get to a situation where you take the religious claim as is, put it up against a compelling state interest test in every case, uh, and the pockmarks that that will create and the exceptionalism that creates for just one particular kind of way of looking at the world becomes manifest, and Justice Scalia was concerned about that on the rule of law, which is why he said no person can be a, a, a law unto, unto himself. Um, Joe Cosby, I'm an attorney in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm thinking about um, Justice Brennan's concurrence in the Amos case, which was relied on by the dissent in Hobby Lobby and by an interesting concurrence by Justice Alito and joined by Justice Kagan in the Hosanna Tabor case. And in the Amos concurrence, uh, Justice Brennan cast um, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause in part as um, necessary protection for religious communities. In that case, he said that the Mormon Church had the right to discharge a janitor in one of its gymnasiums because he didn't um, support the religious objectives of the church. So to what degree is it reasonable relevant to consider and think about uh, the government's regulations on accommodations and other things 
as a potential attack on religious organizations, which as Justice Alito pointed out in his, hobby, in his um, concurrence in Hosanna Tabor, religious organizations, uh, churches, are considered a necessary bulwark against uh, the excesses of government as a kind of institutional protection um, for, uh, you know, against government. Uh, so to what extent should we consider those things, you know, not just in terms of the individual, but in terms of, of the relationship between government and the church and trying to avoid undermining the church by indirectly making it difficult or impossible for individuals to practice what it is the church teaches? written very well on church autonomy, and that's where I lump these things in, and you know, there's no one actually better to comment than Rick. I, I would just say, I, I would put it, I'd actually put the defense of church autonomy within the Establishment Clause. That That's uh, when government acts in such a way to, it, it's effectively establishing uh, uh, its, it, its views in such a way that when churches can't flourish, that that's sort of what old establishments of religion did, actually. You establish one religion and no other religions can participate. Um, so I think the church autonomy, the, the work that Rick's done on church autonomy is uh, exactly the way to go on these, these cases. Um, I don't know if you ground it in the establishment clause, but that's its natural home, I think. Yeah, I, I like, like the questioner. I think the, that Amos' opinion of Justice Brennan's is uh, hugely important um, in, in how we think about religious freedom under the First Amendment for at least two reasons. One is that it, it reminds us that, um, you know, while religious freedom is a very important matter of private conscience, it's not only that, or at least it's not only that for everyone, that for many religious believers, um, uh, one can't simply practice religion by yourself, you know, in your closet, on your own, that communities require that, so it was important that he recognize that. And the other thing I think Amos does that's worth thinking about is it, it reminds us that religious freedom questions are not entirely are not only questions of accommodation. So sometimes we're having debates about accommodation when the government enacts a law that it's, it's duly enacted, it's presumptively valid, it's the kind of law that governments have the power to enact. But then the question is, should there be an exemption to accommodate a believer? But what I think the Amos opinion reminded us, and what I think Hosanna Tabor really reminds us, is there are some religious matters that, and I think Phillip's right for establishment clause reasons, the government lacks power over. The government doesn't have the power to tell, at least in our country, you know, the Church of England whether it should adopt the Book of Common Prayer. It's not, it's not that the Church of England has an exemption from the government's um, liturgy establishing statute, right? There's just no power to do it. And I think it's important that whenever we talk about religious freedom questions that we keep in mind that there are, there are some places to where the government's, you know, writ doesn't run, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and the accommodation question isn't the sum total of the religious freedom. Uh, uh, the one, one thing I would caution, though, is uh, treating this question as an institutional prerogative. It's not freedom of the church, like we have freedom of the press. It's free exercise of religion, which is an individual right, not simply an institutional right. I've noticed a, a parallel um, change in the language from free exercise of religion to freedom of worship, which is aimed at confining uh, the nature of the obligation one has out of religious scruples. Uh, and I think both of those attempts to limit the notion of free exercise are wrong. That doesn't mean that I disagree with w w what has been said about the role of the institution. I don't want to limit it that, though. And it's an individual right as well. Right, as, as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we talked a little bit about um, the sexual revolution and the rise of the nuns as being two of, two of the reasons why you have this collapse of the, I guess, bipartisan consensus, by bi ideological consensus that existed at the time of RIFRA. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering the extent to which maybe a third factor in that is just that we've gotten a lot more distance from Vietnam and the draft and the time when, you know, there was a lot of energy on the left, uh, you know, expended on behalf of conscientious objectors. Uh, and with politics being downstream of culture, I wonder if maybe the real future of religious liberty uh, is finding other issues where there are people on both sides of the aisle who feel themselves uh, threatened by the absence of religious accommodations. 
You know, one of the interesting things about executive power, which I always, uh, which, which I also write on, is that with a lot of other issues, uh, you're not quite sure when people change their mind. On executive power, you know the specific day. <laughs> uh, um, I think that's right with respect to, I think, I think you're right with respect to, uh, to that issue. I think the, the sanctuary movement might be a movement, uh, also some other kinds of issues where you might see the left kind of reasserting itself under the banner of religious belief in a way that, that you haven't seen before. And that might cause things to, to coalesce a little bit more because uh, for exactly the reason you talked about. Dave Baker with Faith and Freedom Coalition. I wanted to start off with uh, one of Professor Munoz's comments that religion or religions generally are not afforded minority status and treatment. Uh, but um, you know, as we discussed the Smith case, you, ha you sort of had a trifecta there. You had, you had a racial, ethnic, religious minority there and, and admittedly brought together a coalition of, you know, say from conservatives that normally wouldn't, Native American issues might not be the top of the list to liberals where religious freedoms might not normally be at the top of the list and all came together. And in fact, one of the Senate holdouts in, in, uh, in uh, the RIFR was uh, Jesse Helms, who was still, you know, obviously n would normally be friendly to religion, but was still concerned about the drug use aspect of it. But what I wanted to ask was, but being that religion generally does not get afforded that treatment. We have a situation, unfortunately, where it's sort of been tyranny of the minority. And, you know, given comments such as from the uh, Commission on Civil Rights that religious liberty is just code word for homophobia, xenophobia, racism, et cetera, you know, you can see where people feel very put upon. And I think it's no accident that in, this, in the election just last week that 81% of self-identified evangelicals all voted for the Republican candidate. And, you know, so, and I, and I don't know that that's a wholesale reversal so much as, you know, put it in football analogy, maybe just a turnover, or maybe even just knocking the other side back for a few yards. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly not, not done, but um, what can we do to, again, prevent this tyranny of the minority situation? Because most people, I think, even what you would self-describe religious conservatives, do have a live and let live attitude. But the problem comes in where you have the vocational aspects, you know, the butcher, the baker, the florist, the photographer, where it's not just a question of challenging belief, but it's compulsion. It's not just don't say anything, but you must affirmatively do something that runs counter to your religious beliefs. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I would, go ahead. I, I would say that um, the, it's, a, it's a very hard, to preserve religious liberty in the long run, I think it's going to be very, very difficult. And the solution is going to be political, not judicial. And the political solution is going to include building a big coalition of people who are understand the value of individual liberty. So you and take the realm of the baker or the florist. Uh, we have to talk about people uh, being able to run their business as they would like to, as they see fit. And that's, uh, we, earlier there was talk about how religious liberty can't just be for one particular religion, it needs to be for uh, all religions. I agree with that. But we should think of protecting religious liberty as a part of protecting liberty simply, right? I mean, this goes, I mean, the, the non-religious baker who doesn't want to bake a cake for whomever, right, don't they have an interest in freedom too? And I actually, what I, one of the things I take from Trump's election is um, in the anti-PC element of his campaign is that people are tired of being told what they must believe and must do. And I actually think there is a coalition out there that says, yeah, let's just leave each other alone. And actually America works out pretty well when we do that. There are particular examples in American history that we have to address, race in particular, and that's because of what government did. Right? But race is the exception. The general rule is freedom. And that's an argument I think actually that resonates with people and, and that we should make it. Because that's how, that's how not only religious freedom but freedom generally uh, will, be, will be preserved. Hi, uh, my name is Robert. Uh, I'm a 2L at Harvard. Um, and on the point that was just made, um, 
regarding all religions, it seems to me that uh, perhaps a foundational question that hasn't necessarily been answered yet is what is religion at all? What is the definition of religion? Uh, the First Amendment does not define it. Um, and, and so the question sort of is, well, so there was a case on, um, the, there was a case this year in the Ninth Circuit um, where, uh, you know, claimed to be part of the Native American church. There was an amicus brief uh, disavowing that connection, uh, and the court expressed some skepticism that this was a religion at all. The gentleman said that they smoked marijuana as part of their religious ceremonies. Um, and so it seems to me the, the, the foundational question is what is religion? How do we define that? Um, but yet, why do we want a court defining that in the first instance? Um, and uh, and so, I mean, it seems that we're inevitably going toward perhaps uh, where the Supreme Court may have to answer that question or actively disavow answering that question. So I'm wondering uh, what we make of that. Is that a question that we need to answer? Uh, or is that, obviously, I think we all have an intuitive idea of what is religion, of course, especially in this room. But there's, um, it seems to be a foundational question. Yeah, there's um Forests and forests have been slaughtered to try to answer the question of <laughs> what religion is, and you know our our colleagues in, in of some religious beliefs. Yeah, <laughs> some of our colleagues in religious studies or theology would really push back on the lawyers and say, you know, you folks are kidding yourself. Religion as a category was something that was kind of constructed in the 16th and 17th centuries as a way to kind of enhance the power of the um, newly ascendant monarchs and all that. I mean, for most of human history, there wouldn't have been this sense that religion was a package that you could separate out from all these other kinds of things. So I get that, that's a problem, it's interesting, it's fun to read and think about. At the same time, we have a constitution that uses the word, and like some other words that aren't defined in the constitution, you know, speech, search, seizure, due process, property, um, courts in doing the kind of courty thing that courts do and, and that we lawyers do, have to come up with some kind of content for those terms. And I'm, I don't think we should be too worried about the fact that inevitably the, the rough and ready, imperfect, but workable definitions of these terms that courts come up with, they might not match exactly with what's in the mind of God, but they're serviceable nonetheless. So if you think of the Hosanna Tabor case, just as an example, um, you know, in, the, in the concurring opinions, I think it was Justices um, uh, Alito and, and Kagan, I believe, but... Um, they underscore the point that, look, when we're trying to administer this so-called ministerial exception, um, you know, the term minister, it works for purposes of this doctrine, but we should remember that we're not talking just about kind of people that look like Pastor Bob from the First Congregationalist Church. It could be a very broad understanding, and, and this will be worked out case by case as things go along. I guess I feel like that's kind of what we do in public law all the time, and so I'm, I'm less troubled than some by the fact that the boundaries of the concept of religion are a little fuzzy. It's in the Constitution. We've got no choice but to do the best we can. You know, Michael started off our discussion by pointing out how confused this area of law was. And think about it. One of the reasons why it's so confused is we cannot define the fundamental term. And although I agree with Rick, we can try to get some workable definitions. Even the process of defining the, fu the fundamental term can violate the various prohibitions in question. Saying something is a religion or is not a religion raises both establishment and free exercise kinds of concerns. So you're right in doing that, and that's why I think it's so jumbled, and that's why I think Justice Scalia and Smith wanted to get away from the kinds of cases that forced us to do that, because the inquiry is so difficult, and it, is, and, and it does threaten the very value itself. Can I also just take a, a moment here to respond to the previous comment, too, about some of the I think bad things that have been said about religion in this particular campaign by probably the folks that I am more aligned with. There have been, um, but I don't judge conservatives by the worst things conservatives say. And I don't think conservatives should judge liberals by the worst things that some liberals say. Most of the liberals I know care about religion and they think it's very valuable. They don't like the way it plays out in some of these culture war things. But I think it's an unfair <coughs> condemnation to put everybody in the same category because of a few statements in the same way that I think it's unfair to do that the other way. Yes. 
So, um, Professor Marshall earlier discussed that one of the troubles with uh, the pre-Smith test for the First Amendment was the difficulty of distinguishing between religious moral convictions and the variety of other sorts of moral convictions. And I think that's a very valid um, concern, but I wonder what the, what the analysis would be in the trinity of cases, um, the Kennedy cases, Romer, um, Lawrence, and Obergefell, where essentially under a lot of understandings of these cases, the core is that certain types of moral reasonings are facially invalid and other sorts of moral reasonings are the appropriate basis of law. In Lawrence, Kennedy says something along the lines of mere moral condemnation by tra traditional value systems is an inadequate basis of law. And it seems that he's doing the reverse, that he's saying secular humanistic moral values, economic benefit, utilitarianism, consequentialist values are appropriate in their basis of law, but traditional religious values are an inappropriate basis for law. And it seems that that kind of, in and of itself, is the basis of a lot of these questions, that if the specific moral vision limiting the appropriate basis of law to utilitarian consequentialist values is adopted, then that limits an entire category of moral considerations, even not only religious ones. For example, under that kind of a strict understanding, it would be fairly tough to justify anti-discrimination laws themselves, which a lot of people either, some, some people, many ascribe to anti-discrimination laws from a perspective of religious values, and others ascribe to various other non-consequentialist value systems to justify the utilitarian, but very, uh, to, to justify anti-discrimination. But there are very few people who justify anti-discrimination under the logic that yes, the economy of the southern states will be hurt if we systematically discriminate against minorities. Yeah, so, so um, to the extent Justice Kennedy and Lawrence <coughs> said, I mean, that, that we ought not to be driven by religious definitions of morality because this is a pluralistic society, it's not a theocracy. Um, to that extent, I can agree with him. But of course, he made a much broader claim um, that morality itself, or if, if, if you want to reject the laws of nature's God as being the ba basis, reject the laws of nature as well, right? The, the, um, th that, that, that seems to throw out all sorts of things that are, you know, the, are the very foundation of law. And, and, and on that premise, I think he's just absolutely wrong. Um, and it, now we can disagree with where the rejection of that premise leads uh, or where retaining that premise uh, ought to lead. And I, I think he's wrong in the outcome in those cases as well as the premise. Um, but, that's, but, but the notion that, that morality has no place um, in, in, in crafting of law is rather bizarre when you look at the history of law in this country. Is it not? I mean, it's just, it, it really is. And to say that with a straight face, like he did in that opinion, like, like it was an uncontested point, universally acclaimed, it's rather bizarre. And I'll just leave it at that. Can, can I get, um, I, I, I thought the, the point was well stated and I, I, I couldn't do anything but comment on how well stated it was. But I, I wanna get back to an earlier question. Um, there's, there's uh, since Scalia is such an important figure at this year's conference in particular, uh, it seems that there's a uh, textual argument a, a, in support of Scalia Smith's decision that's so obvious but no one ever mentions it, which is the text of the First Amendment says Congress and with incorporation of the states, but shall make no law. No law is actually, are the most important words. No law is a categorical, Congress can't make a law. The, the Sherbert approach implicitly says Congress uh, can make no law encroaching on or prohibiting the free exercise of uh, religion, unless there's a good reason to, right? Scalia has to be right, right? That interpretation has to be right because of no law, right? Com contrast that with the Fifth Amendment, a reasonable, um, you, know, you can take uh, property uh, with due process of law, right? Searches and seizures must be reasonable. There's balancing, but no law means no law. 
whatever the interpretation you're, you're going to give to free exercise has to be categorical. It can't be uh, the government can burden, can't burden religious liberty unless there's a good reason to do so. That's just implausible f from a straight no. reading of the text. No, 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 no. <laughs> right. you, you, I mean, you can't stop, you can't, you can't put a period after no law. Congress shall pass no law. <laughs> abridging the freedom of speech. Well, you have to know what's encompassed by the freedom of speech. And if things are outside of the protection of freedom of speech, which was a thing, uh, it wasn't all speech, it was the freedom of speech. And so they can't pass any law abridging that, but they can pass laws that are, fall outside that compass. And so we got to move from the no law language to figuring out what free exercise of religion meant. And it didn't, it didn't mean- But you, you can't have the compelling state interest exception then. Yeah. It, it just can't follow. It's not logically coherent. <laughs> Can I say one thing in response to the question? Yeah. Uh, you, where the last question makes, uh, took me was to this point that I've um, you know, tried to impose on people often but failed. It seems to me that generally speaking, we, we're better off if we focus on legislative outputs rather than um, the argumentative inputs. Um, if we get into the business of policing and evaluating the sort of the nature of the arguments that are made for positions, whether we're doing that from like a Rawlsian perspective or something else, it strikes me that we're really um, dig ourselves into a hole, that, that it's very difficult to distinguish, you know, a Kantian argument from a utilitarian one, from a moral one, from an atomist one, and then identify some as being permissible in discourse and some not. It seems to be the better thing, again, is just to ask what is it that the legislature has done and is that within the power of the legislature to do and did it, uh, or did it in some way infringe on a right that the Constitution protects. It's, it doesn't seem to me we move the ball much by getting into the, this is kind of a very Justice Scalia point, right? Legislative history. <laughs> so. Professor Marshall, we're up against a hard deadline. You have the penultimate word because I get the ultimate. <laughs> All right, fantastic. First of all, I wanna thank that question. It's a, it's a fabulous question. Uh, one of the things that happens at ACS conventions and the Federalist Society conventions is the constant search to find coherence in a Justice Kennedy opinion. <laughs> uh, uh, but besides that, I, I, and I will take a second, I think you can only, uh, I, I, there's always an irony in the fact that trying to find a neutral stance from which to evaluate something in religion terms is impossible. There's no such thing as a pure neutrality. Any position has a religious implication to it. I think you know the effort and the idea of secularism, which is defended on neutrality grounds, really has to be understood as a second best neutrality uh, because it's not neutral in many ways to those who oppose that. So I think that's the insight you have, and it's a very good one. Well, the final word I'll reserve is that we we can lay the blame for all of this at the door of Jesus Christ Himself. Because he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. But he failed to give us a large volume that Scalia would love that defined which were Caesar's things and which were God's things. And that's why God later made lawyers. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful time. Good. Good.